Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and in this video I'd like to discuss the uh, the potential trap of his own making that Rishi Sunak seems to have walked into. As there's a report now that he's struggling to recruit an ethics advisor to replace the ones who resigned during Johnson's tenure due to the rampant lack of ethics in government. Frankly, the Tories need to be quite careful here because sleaze is one of the things that caused them to lose power last time. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So, Rishi Sunak may have got himself into a little bit of a mess, admittedly not helped by some hapless MPs in his parliamentary party. Because I see there's an article that, that several people have turned down the opportunity to be appointed ethics advisor to the Prime Minister. Now, before I explain what the main issue is and the potential consequences, see, let's look at why there's a vacancy at all. Boris Johnson's first ethics advisor quit because he'd investigated allegations against Priti Patel of bullying, found that she was guilty of bullying, but Johnson basically rewrote the report and took no action. His ethics advisor at the time, Sir Alex Allen, quit because he considered the position untenable. Like, what's the point of being an ethics advisor? Most of the time when government's just doing its work, you're not really doing a lot. Then on the rare occasions you need to do something, your work is chucked in the bin. So then Johnson appointed Lord Christopher Geitz. Now, he had a lot of work to do. He investigated the Prime Minister himself. The arrangements over the payment for Boris Johnson's tatty Downing Street refurbishment but he botched the investigation. He found no evidence against the Prime Minister. It later transpired the reason he found no evidence against the Prime Minister is because his investigation consisted of asking Boris Johnson, a known liar, a few questions. But then the Electoral Commission carried out a proper investigation into the same thing, actually got themselves documentary evidence that proved beyond doubt Johnson was guilty. And Guy was made to look a proper nana. So he carried out another investigation, but he still inexplicably found Johnson not guilty, despite the clear proof, which was by this time in the public domain. Guy eventually resigned. In theory, it's because the government was planning on breaking international law. That was the official reason. But in reality, it's because his reputation was taken a proper battering. He had once been widely respected. Also, he'd sought assurance from Johnson that his role would be beefed up. He'd be given more autonomy to initiate his own investigations because the state of play is that they only initiate investigations when the Prime Minister asks them to. Well, if there's something that desperately needs investigating and the Prime Minister doesn't tell them to investigate it, they're made to look ridiculous. But then Johnson went back on the promise and, and Guy never got that power. Then Boris Johnson rewrote the ministerial code so that even if ministers were somehow found to be in breach, if it was if it was undeniable, which was becoming something of a certainty with his cabinet of ne'er-do-wells, then they wouldn't have to resign because that's supposed to be the penalty or, us or was used to be the penalty. If you breach the ministerial code, you are expected to resign. Basically, nobody would have any respect left for Guy if he'd have remained in post after all that. So then Johnson was down another ethics advisor. No one else was appointed before Johnson himself had to resign. Then Liz Truss made no effort to secure the services of another. When she was asked about it, she said, I don't need one. I know the difference between right and wrong. A dodgy position to adopt, but in reality may well be a less risky approach than Sunak's is turning out to be. Rishi Sunak became prime minister and instantly de declared that his government would operate with integrity. But it's not going very well. He appointed Sweller Braverman to the Home Office six days after she had to resign for threatening national security. Later on, uh, Labour put a motion before Parliament to say, well, we should really have a look at the reasons why she was reappointed. But Tory MPs voted it down. So, OK, nice one for transparency there. Gavin Williamson, he was forced to resign over allegations of bullying MPs. Now Dominic Raab is facing allegations of bullying officials in three different government departments over a period of years. He has been investigated, but he's lasting longer than Williamson because bullying officials is clearly less serious than bullying Tory MPs. I suppose this is because Tory MPs can threaten to withdraw their votes if the government doesn't act. Officials can't do anything other than resign. Mind you, quite a few seem to be putting in formal complaints now, which is a big reason why Sunak wants an ethics advisor but wants to make sure they don't actually offer any firm advice on ethics. 
The issue is this. Sunak's cabinet, just like Johnson's, is full of some of the most unpleasant MPs the Tories have to offer. It may not be quite as bad as Johnson's, but there are still some fairly terrible people in there. An ethics advisor with the power to initiate their own investigations would shine a spotlight on this awful behaviour. An independent ethics advisor would have to investigate the circumstances under which Brave Mundus was reappointed to the position of Home Secretary so soon, for example. They'd have to investigate the allegations against Dominic Raab. There are other investigations pending as well into other Tory MPs who used to be ministers, maybe not quite so senior since Johnson fell, but could still provide some very bad PR for the party. So having an independent ethics advisor would make it impossible for Sunak to both keep the people he needs in cabinet in order to main some, maintain some sort of shaky truce with various factions in the party, but at the same time appear to be leading with integrity. On the other hand, it's not as simple as just getting a toady to be ethics advisor, because that's the usual thing. You just appoint someone who will be loyal to you to do the job. The problem is that if the person appointed is not seen as being honourable across the political spectrum, the position will be a sham. Very awkward position for Sunak to be in. Being unable to appoint an ethics advisor means opposition MPs will keep explaining to the public why this is. Nobody will take the job because Sunak won't allow them to do their job properly for fear of uncovering even more sleaze than we already know about from the newspaper reporting. If he gets an ethics advisor, but they don't carry out investigations into various allegations, then it becomes obvious they're just a puppet and whatever reputation they had becomes badly damaged just like the previous ethics advisor. If they get an ethics advisor and allow them to carry out investigations, then the government is exposed as basically being a cabal of crooks. Truss probably had the best plan in not trying to recruit one at all. Her assertion that she doesn't need one because she knows the difference between right and wrong, of course that comes across as incredibly arrogant, potentially even comes across like she's trying to hide something, but could still be less embarrassing than where Sunak is stuck right now, actually trying to get an ethics advisor and having people go, <laughs> no. And although I say Sunak has himself trapped a bit here, Really, this is an issue for the wider Conservative Parliamentary Party. Like, the reason Sunak's trapped is because he has to give cabinet positions to reckless morons in order to maintain that balance of power. If the various factions allowed him to promote more discreet, better behaved leaders from amongst them, because each of those factions must well have someone amongst their number that would be perfectly good in cabinet and wouldn't attract such um, scandals. You know, if they could do that, then his problem wouldn't be anywhere near as severe. And this is something that'll hurt them. And it'll hurt them all. Because there's no way that Labour in particular won't hammer the issue of Tory sleaze come the election. You know, they're picking away at it now and then already. I mean, Angela Rayner, I keep saying Angela Rayner, deputy leader. It's pretty much her job to do that. that Labour have got someone who's full time investigating Tory sleaze. They've basically got a shadow secretary of state for Tory sleaze. But it'll be a major line of attack during the general election campaign. A party that can be labelled as fundamentally untrustworthy will, at a stroke, weaken all of their election promises. It won't matter what's in their manifesto if voters don't trust them to keep their word. You know, sleaze is what badly damaged John Major's government leading up to their loss in 1997. History is repeating itself and the Tories just don't seem to have learned lessons. And the corruption and sleaze this time is way worse. And this is just one issue, but it speaks to the party's general brokenness. Like it should be obvious to all Tory MPs, all of them, every single one, that they need to be able to present themselves as being professional and honourable, even if it's not true. If they can't even work together to achieve that facade at least, how much less able will they be to be able to come together on the genuinely contentious issues that divide them time and again? But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join buttons for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.